Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming for on a Monday morning. I think you'll find this is going to be well worth the time. Uh, I'd like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Venkatesh. He heads the glaucoma section for all of Aravind. Uh, and, and he may go into a little bit of detail about how they all decide and get together. And, but, he, but he also runs the uh, Pondicherry version of uh, hot, which is this hospital right here. Uh, he'll give you some numbers about how many, um, do we, you gonna do the number of patients a little bit today too, or? So uh, what we think of as giving care is, and I think we do a good job of it too, but what, when you talk about teams that are changing the world, uh, th these, uh, it's really hard to beat the Arab centers. And Dr. Venkatesh is unbelievable teacher, and uh, as a host, you, you, there's, no button, there's no better place to go than to Pondicherry or, or any of the Arab systems, but particularly. And I've loved to watch his surgery and uh, learn from his skill at, at multiple different types of, of uh, complex cataracts, complex glaucoma cases. And fortunately, we're, we're in the process of working out some pro projects that we're going to do because we would really want to be we want to be their true partners in terms of an academic uh, setup and actually helpful um, and so I think you'll be fascinated to see I hope you mentioned something about the Google thing maybe a little bit about that which is just a fascinating part of what uh, what the capability of a center like this is and um, also, for those that don't know, uh, Dr. Sham here is from uh, Nepal, uh, Tilganga, and he's part of the glaucoma unit there, and he will be spending three weeks with us, and we get to keep um, Venki for about two more days. So learn everything you guys can. Thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's a pleasure being with you all. No, it's been a long pending visit to Salt Lake, but I'm enjoying the visit starting from Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Alan, uh, we, we've still not figured out going around Alan, Alan Crandall's house now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I need to make another couple of visits to complete the tour, but, but it's so, so interesting, both the city and uh, uh, the kind of uh, warmthness which we get from the team here. So uh, this is something which, uh, which is close to our heart, but we didn't know how friendly we are to the environment, but we are trying to understand that better and better now. So I thought I will share with you, because there's a lot of interest from this side also to uh, kind of uh, uh, be environmental friendly by reducing waste or segregation of waste and things like that. So I choose this topic uh, for the presentation. Um, in fact, this is the second time I'm doing it. The first one was at Kellogg's uh, Grand Round. So it was specially prepared for this uh, particular session and uh, I have, uh, uh, I'm not an expert in environment, no, I'm just an ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist, forced to now uh, uh, administrate a hospital in Pondicherry for the last uh, seven, eight years, but uh, I, I enjoy the work and now we try to understand how uh, the three P's which the environment experts call, you now when you are looking at people you're looking at profits, to make profits, you know, in the form of patients and our customers. And it's so important to look at the planet. So when you're looking at people and profit, I think planet is so important. But we also have to understand that when you look at the planet, profits will automatically come. The only thing we'll have to negotiate with uh, our own team, their mindset, and of course the regulations which you have around us. but. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this presentation is just to kind of uh, see overview of what happens at Arvind. So there's a beautiful campus in Pondicherry, which you can see, like it's a 25 acre campus. And uh, this building is 200,000 square feet. And now almost 60% of elect electricity is generated from the solar panels. It's not like the sun here. You know, way back in south of India, 365 days, you'll have sun. <laughs> Even in a peak monsoon, there'll be a couple of hours of rain, and then you'll have sun. So you, you don't need a dryer at home. Mm -hmm. So you can always dry your clothes outside. So we can generate a pretty good, uh, and you can see the uh, paddy fields right behind the campus. So we uh, grow our rice 
uh, wheat and everything there for our own garden uh, i mean for our own canteen and the uh, co the condom where the uh, staff and uh, uh, students stay they running their canteen everything is from uh, most of the products are made here and then you have a beautiful water recycling plant here one of the biggest in southeast asia decentralized wastewater treatment plant dwats so basically it's got uh, organic inorganic bacteria and it's totally chemical free uh, sewage treatment plant so that filters around 300000 liters of water daily so 90% of water we use is reused again for gardening and taking care of these uh, uh, agricultural part of the uh, campus uh, how many of you are aware of this overshoot day here yeah. like what is the environmental resource we have for that particular year year and how much we are what is the period we exhaust that is called the world overshoot day so environment experts they make this for every year and depending on the previous year's experience you now they come up with a overshoot day for each and every country i don't know where uh, india is but uh, but i'm sure we can see where us is so rest of the months you now we are using the resources which is there for for the next years or the next generations so if you take globally i think it's august 1st 2008 and this over the years you now it's 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 kind of from being february to now august so we are depleting all these natural resources to take care of ourselves so this is what now environmental experts are worried about why are we getting cyclones why are we getting tsunamis unusual rainfalls which they say once we have never seen this in the last 100 years in the last 150 years so we had a uh, one of the worst uh, uh, cyclone and uh, flood flooding in our neighboring state kerala a couple of weeks back almost 200 to 300 people lost their lives several people lost their livelihood and it is one of the most popular tourist destination in the country god's own country kerala i don't think they can get tourists for the next two years it's so badly damaged so that is what is happening across the globe you no know, every other day we hear about tsunamis in indonesia so somewhere all these are related to how we are friendly to the environmental so these are the sdgs which are going to transform our goals the sustainable development goals and of which the 11 and 12 are very important you no know, for healthcare and anybody working in our area sustainable <coughs> cities and communities responsible consumption and production and climate action so these are some of the important things where we have some control over it if you see this publication in lancet it says climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century and where is the opportunity for that <clears throat> i think the opportunity is with us tackling the climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century both are on the lancet front pages <clears throat> so we need to see how we can be friendly so these are all the who guidelines for healthy hospitals a healthy planet and for healthy people so if you if you see number 1 will be energy efficiency how efficient we are going to be in using energy green building designs you now where you can bring in a lot of uh, daylight and air condition only where it is required alternate energy generation getting solar windmill and all the other ways of generating transportation which is very important lot of times people don't show any interest on this you now how are you getting your customers or patients inside into the system how are we getting our staff into the system it's so important you know when uh, jeff tabin travels all the way from where is it stamper yeah no now uh, when he was here in salt lake oh. on the way to park city right yes uh, yeah. no when you are coming all the way from there you know, we have to see how much of carbon footprint we generate no all these are very important you are coming five days a week morning once evening again we are going back so there is a lot of uh, uh, carbon footprint related to transportation food water and also you know how do we conserve uh, uh, and more importantly how do we uh, kind of work with our waste 
So the the three P model, which I was just telling you, the the social impact uh, which Arvind was doing over the years, you know, reaching the unreach, getting the people who cannot be assessed, uh, uh, meeting uh, people who are in the bottom of pyramid. So we were thinking, uh, you no, know, we were kind of doing a social impact. But over the years, we found that by doing a social impact, we were able to make profits. You know, with our 30 to 40 percent paying patients, we were able to sustain 50 to 60 percent of totally free or steeply subsidized charges for another group of patients who can't afford services. And we were reaching them. It's not that the patients were coming inside to a facility. We were going and finding them through outreach, through vision centers. But now we understand that we are also friendly to the environment. So, so that is where I think uh, sustainable care delivery comes into place. This is just to show you an article which was published in 2013 in Journal of Eye, where they calculated the carbon footprint of doing one phacoemulsification. And we have to extrapolate this to the number of phacoemulsifications <coughs> we do across the globe. And it can change from developed world to the developing world. But again, the point to understand is a single FACO emits 180 kilogram of carbon equivalent. And this equivalent of driving a car 500 kilometers. Okay, So that is one FACO waste which we generate. And over 50% of these greenhouse gas emissions originate from procurement of supplies. No, you we just open a packet. But for the packet to come inside into our system, for the packet to be manufactured, there's so much of energy efficiency and a lot of things which are being used. And usually the supplies nowadays are largely single use disposables. So if you just see this break, procurement is fifty three point eight percent, building and energy use is thirty six point one percent, and travel would be another. 10%. So ophthalmology is one of the real high volume outpatient specialties. That's why every institute has got a separate ophthalmic center or an eye center separately. I believe you are also running a part of an, a, a, the main hospital or the children's hospital. But if you go across uh, US now, every eye center is a different building. Maybe Iowa, Wilmer, uh, <coughs> Wills Eye Institute. Because there's so much of people who are coming into the system, and most of the procedures are, again, daycare procedures where they come and leave. They don't have to stay with us. And it's got a high surgical throughput. And uh, cataract surgery is the uh, commonest. It's almost 80 or 90 percent of our procedures are cataract surgeries with high disposable supplies and material component. This is just to give you a global uh, overview of how many million surgeries we perform. 26 million surgeries in 2017. This is almost <coughs> near accurate data. And the procedure volume is growing at 3.1% per year. So 2018, we'll be doing another 3.1% more than the 26 million. Because we know the need for cataract is changing. From somebody who had cataract, now to somebody for a need. It's a clear lens extraction for a narrow angle, or maybe a clear lens extraction because just because he walked into a eye facility. That's happening. So there was an edit editorial sometime back in uh, uh, BJO, you know, and uh, it writes about cataract surgery in India. Cataract surgery in India, because cataract is a malignant disease. If you don't operate, it will metastasize to the neighboring clinic. <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the kind of problem we see in, in some of the urban centers. And we know most of the procedures are fake emulsification, almost two-thirds in the globe. But the one-third, again, of uh, developing world, we do more of small incision than FACO. This is just to give you an overview of uh, Aravind in uh, uh, South India. You can't, now we are just moving into a little bit into South India with our seventh tertiary care center, which is going to be started somewhere here in Andhra Pradesh, the neighboring state where they speak Telugu. And we have all been in a place where they speak Tamil, or Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. And we have six tertiary care centers now, six secondary care centers, six outpatient centers. These outpatient centers are mainly doing follow-up. They don't do surgery. They just do follow-up. But there is a doctor available to see uh, post-ops and also 
uh, glaucoma reviews and DR reviews. And we have this 67 primary eye care centers, which are already 71 and 72. Yesterday we had the 72nd center, but as I'm just showing you data for 67, I just have 67 here. And it serves a population of 80 million. So this is what happens in a year. And uh, for the last few years, we are close, seeing close to 4 million outpatients, and we are doing close to 500,000 procedures, 300,000 cataracts, and 178,000 other procedures, specialty procedures, lasers, and injections. And if you see almost 51% is paying now, and 49% is free and subsidized. The paying volume is gradually increasing, even after I started my career in Arvind. When I was a resident in 94, it was less than 25%. And now the paying patients is almost 50%. It's crossed 51 last year for the first time. For simple reasons, India is developing. And the other important reason, even the people below poverty line now are insured by the government of Tamil Nadu. And this scheme is very popular scheme. And now uh, our uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has made it a national scheme called Modi Care. So there are people below poverty line, al almost 60 million people below <coughs> poverty line are given 400,000 Indian rupees for four years to take care of something which is life-saving and eye-saving. So many of the people who can't pay for the treatment who are going to our free hospital now have a smart card and uh, your money is processed by an insurance company and within a couple of weeks we are paid as equal to the paying services. So our paying is also increasing. So when you take the process in the hospital, I'm sure it's uh, 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 everywhere it's the same, no, uh, one is the footprint related to access. How are they getting into the facility? So today morning when we drive in, we see no, terrific traffic. No? Uh, Saturday, Sunday, I didn't see anybody on the road. Today morning, it was every signal, uh, Alan had to wait and said, two minutes, we'll be there. Two minutes, we'll be there. <laughs> so there is a uh, way you have to access the care. And then there is a footprint related to diagnosis and advice. There's a footprint related to treatment, and more importantly, the footprint related to follow-up care, which is very important. Sometimes we can treat, but some of the chronic diseases need regular follow-ups. They have to come back three months, six months for visual fields or lasers or whatever be the care. So there is a significant footprint in follow-up care. And uh, these are all important when we see transport of staff, visitors, patients, even the transport of suppliers. How are they getting the goods inside into mm -hmm. the system? Procurement of goods and services. How are we using the energy? And more importantly, what are we doing with the waste? So when we take what happens at Arvind, so the one thing which we have tried always to reduce the carbon footprint in access is we made the access pretty long time. So the hospital is open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. So the registration starts at 7 a.m. and closes at 5.30 p.m. So even if we have to close the clinic by 6.37. We still do a basic examination and give them a follow-up. And uh, for any general problems, it's a non-appointment system. Somebody walks in and wants a primary care, like in the form of they want glasses, or they, they have a foreign body, or they have a red eye. It's usually a non-appointment system. Only review or any procedures would be appointment system. And they come back for a follow-up for a visual fields or a OCT or they come back for a, a incision and curatage or a laser procedure, then it's appointment. Otherwise, it's usually a non-appointment system. And even if somebody fails an appointment, walks into it, we still see. It's like getting into the class after seven. <laughs> what is the point in saying, I can't see you? You, know, you, have, you have missed the appointment. He has to again travel back home and he has to travel again for another appointment day. So let's see him. So that's how our system works. And we do all care, primary, secondary, and tertiary care. So this is just to show you the flow of uh, uh, patients in the system from uh, 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 the patients are registered and at every step they are escorted to uh, the next step. Uh, the next step would be auto refraction and then an optometrist would do a regular uh, manual refraction 
then their intraocular pressure is uh, checked. They, uh, this is a kind of opportunistic screening where most of the patients above the age of 40, we do blood pressure and also make sure uh, we assess their blood sugar. And then the preliminary examination is done and uh, dilatation and all the procedures, rest of it is done before the final. And then uh, the patients are escorted to either pharmacy, optical, or if they need surgery to the patient educators or counselors, or if they need some specialty care, they are escorted to the specialty clinic. So we try to do this all in two hours time, in the non-appointment. So we have a system to track when the patient has registered, entered into a clinic, and from that point, we make sure that all the test, whatever you see here, is completed in two hours. See, that's the commitment we want to give for anybody who walks into the system. And how do we know the load? We know the load from our previous five years experience. So we have an AI in place, or we have a diary, which our patient educators prepare every year, where for today, so today is a pre-festival day in, in uh, Pondicherry and Tamil Nadu, Diwali the previous day, tomorrow is Diwali, which is Tuesday morning. So we know the expected outpatients is going to be 300 or 400, not the 1,200 which we normally get. So, so we have a plan for that for the whole year. So we know when the holidays are, like your Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, when we have quarterly and halfly holidays or annual holidays in summer between April and May, we have the maximum load of patients. So we know across that week what is our expected outpatient and expected cataract surgery, but not other specialties, at least expected cataract. So this allows us to kind of plan ourselves the previous day or for the whole week. You know, we advise doctors not to take a, a leave on that week or unless it's an emergency and we request all the team to be available. Even the non-clinical team to support the clinical team you know, in helping in registration and escorting and things like that. So several things like that happen. Basically, again, you know, to, to meet that volume uh, wherever it is needed. So one person does one task and there is an effective utilization of the equipments, either be a Humphrey field analyzer or a OCT or a laser machine, it will be optimally used. Like for example, my Humphrey, there are two Humphrey field analyzers in glaucoma clinic in Pondicherry, four in Madurai and more depending on the volume. But each machine will be optimally utilized. You know, they'll be noted down what time they started a patient, what time they finished, and then the next time when they started, so roughly they can come, they normally do 15 visual fields to 20 visual fields with one machine in a day. The same for two machines. Same way, any equipment, we know exactly you know, how many patients they would normally use. And if it is less, probably the reason is there were not appointments or the OP was significantly less on those days. <coughs> so when we talk again about access, so we did a lot of outreach over the years where the people uh, had to come to a, a, a kind of a campsite. So where our team goes and sets up a clinic and then the patients come to the campsite and they are examined. So this camp happens once in three months, once in six months, in some places even once in a year. So people were waiting for accessing to these eye camps. So there was a lot of delay in treatment and uh, we were not very happy with the way uh, the quality of workup also was in eye camp. The, a lot of reasons, the crowd in the camp, the <clears throat> limited time to do examination, uh, unavailability of uh, uh, technology to examine the patient. So, so we started uh, uh, vision centers. I'll just show you what uh, vision center does. So this is a vision center, which is uh, uh, around 40 kilometers from Pondicherry. So there are 10 centers with Pondicherry and totally now 72 centers. Uh, across uh, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. So basically there are two uh, staff who are working here. One is a patient educator who takes care of uh, uh, the pharmacy, the electronic medical record, and the other one is a technician who is trained to do optometry, refraction services, and also basic eye examination. So they do basic eye examination, they do the blood pressure, whatever I, I said in the OP happens here for the patient, and, uh, and they also take beautiful images of the fundus, you know, after dilatation, or even uh, some cases non-metriatic way also the camera can take. And then every patient has got a personal consultation 
with a physician who is usually a third year resident in the base hospital so like uh, each uh, uh, doctor will have five centers connected and they will do only that work for that whole month so they'll be posted again somebody else would come up and do that job so that this is one way they learn how to manage a clinic also so they do teleconsultation and then the patients are offered most of the 90% of the problems are solved there 10% who need referrals for surgery or some other procedures are referred to the base hospital so so this is uh, one way we reach patient the other one is the camp and in camp only the cataract patients are transported so if you if you if you if you say a, a camp where we see normally 300 outpatients there will be 75 to 100 inpatients who are coming in on a weekend so they will they will be coming in two buses so if, if we didn't do that you now they will be traveling in different modes of travel to reach the hospital so that would again kind of you know increase the carbon footprint in their access so we now understand that even by doing outreach and transporting them as a group in big buses we are helping the environment and then after the surgery we are dropping them back at the camp site and then review camp is held at the camp site or in the vision center nearest vision center so they don't have to come back to a base hospital for a follow up after a month or 6 weeks or whatever period you want to see them back so we go to the camp site a small team goes and then they examine them there give them glasses so these are some of the uh, centers you know where they are located around the tertiary care center this is around madurai around tirunelveli around coimbatore around pondicherry so so this pocket is still empty so i was just telling uh, alan that we are going to start a new hospital in tanjavur by 2020 so which will have uh, vision centers around it and then the whole of tamil nadu would be covered so our idea is to have 200 vision centers and wean off all our eye camps and make sure within a 5 to 10 kilometer radius they will have a good eye care they can uh, they can go to a vision center or a community center or to one of the uh, tertiary care centers mm -hmm. so they don't have to go beyond 5 to 10 kilometers so that's the aim for 2030 so by 2025 we're going to have 150 vision centers and by 2020 we will have 200 centers covering almost the whole Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. So now we are seeing close to a half a million patients in these vision centers. So this is the uh, data for 67 vision centers, uh, 2017 and 18. Almost uh, uh, more than half a million patients we are seeing through these vision centers. So these are people who are living in that same town or same village. So they are just going and assessing a care uh, without much of a traveler. So average of about 2,000 visits a day. So this is again to show you a little bit more on the uh, details. We are giving close to 86,000 uh, glasses or spectacles to these outpatients. And uh, the best part is, you know, the, the glass acceptance, usually in an outreach it is only 50%. When you go to a camp and give them glasses, if you give 100, only 50 of them buy. The other 50 don't buy. But here the acceptance is almost 90%. So the, the major issues are refractory error and cataract and all the other conditions to follow. So if we can do this in a better way, so that is what we are able to achieve through these vision centers. And the cataract surgery advised, if you see it's only 25,000. This is because still there are camps happening around the centers. So people prefer to go to an eye <coughs> camp for a surgery than a vision center. For a simple reason is that they are being transported to the base hospital. They are being followed up at the campsite. So if they come to a vision center and they are referred for a surgery, they have to travel on their own. So there is a travel cost. There is an uh, uh, attender which they have to take and a lot of other costs related to food and things like that. So still people prefer to go to a camp, but I'm sure these numbers will increase once we start weaning off the camps. This is just to show you a very recent change which we did to reduce uh, carbon footprint. So what happens is in a vision center, uh, the patient chooses a frame and the frame is sent to the central lab in one of the tertiary care centers. So there is a two days which is involved in this and also you no know, taking this frame and giving it, uh, uh, there was a carbon footprint and there was a cost also involved. And then lab fits the lens and then another two days for the glass to be completed and again to reach the vision center. So if you take totally, you know, it was like five plus days for the patient to get. Again, this was a reason or a barrier for 
some of the acceptance. You know, when you say four or five days, they say, no, I'll, I'll try somewhere else. You know? Then what we did was re we revisited it and we said, well, no, why don't we go online? Send uh, the frame details by email. You know, whatever he has selected, the image of that or the number of that frame is, is sent uh, by email to the uh, central lab. And the lab fits the lens in the, on the same day. When you send it, it's done on the same day. And within a day, now it comes back to the vision center. So now from like uh, four or five days, now it's become two days. So by this, the acceptance went from 70, 75% to 90% now. So there are things which keep, we constantly revisit and make changes which are patient friendly. And now we understand that it is environmental friendly also. No? So, so I, think, I think that is where we are making more profits again. So the acceptance, when it goes from 75 to 90%, your profits also go up. So this is uh, to show you some other ways of screening. So when there is uh, patients cannot access for a DR care, so now we are putting up cameras in primary health centers, which are uh, related to government and also in diabetic clinics where they don't have facility for uh, retinal examination because it's so important we need to take care of the retina in these patients. They just take care uh, of the diabetes and they prescribe medications. But normally they come weekly one day to collect the medications in primary health center where it is given free medications are given. So we have trained the nurses there and uh, uh, we have these low cost fundus cameras and these images are uh, uh, taken and then sent to the reading center and then we are giving uh, uh, reports immediately to them so that they, they, they have an additional care now and these patients need not uh, travel all the way to any eye care facility. So when it comes to uh, diagnosis and advice, no, it's, uh, the system is designed and it allows all the investigations to be done on the same day. If somebody wants a cataract surgery and he walks in today, Monday, and if he's ready, he'll be operated Tuesday, unless there is a contraindication, maybe ocular or systemic, or he's on antiplatelet, or he needs some other cardiologist fitness and things like that. If he's a normal patient, healthy adult, no, well-controlled diabetes, hypertension. Usually, if he's prepared, the next day he's operated. He's not shortlisted or he's not given a waiting list or an appointment for a month or two months for a surgery. So, so if most of the uh, uh, investigations are done in the same day, even if a diabetic, uh, uh, a proliferative retinopathy or a severe non-proliferative, if he's, if he's already prepared you know, for a fluorescein or a laser or something like that, it's also done on the same day, preferably, or maybe the, uh, the immediate next day if he's ready to wait. So there is no waiting period for most of the procedures. So in the treatment also, we try to complete the care in a day or in the visit, like as I said before, uh, if he needs uh, any lasers or injections uh, for uh, Avastin or some other lucentis or injections like that, even then it is done on the same day. And 85 to 90 percent of the spectacles are also delivered on the same day. So all the tertiary care centers have uh, state-of-art labs uh, set up by SLR, and then they can grind and make sure the glasses are delivered in a couple of hours. So they give the prescription, they take the order, they go and have a coffee or a lunch, and they come back and they collect the spectacles and leave, so that they don't have to travel again back to get the spectacles. And patients who are advised for surgery are also, if they are ready for admission, if they are coming from a far off distance, they get admitted, otherwise they come as daycare the next day. So one uh, uh, area which I touched upon to begin with is again the cataract surgery and the large carbon footprint. You know? So high energy consumption, a lot of uh, capital equipments and surgical instruments and a uh, lot of disposables used you know, for each and every uh, surgery and there is a complex waste which is generated and, uh, and also there is a lot of water usage for uh, uh, sterilization and washing and all other uh, aspects which are related to surgery. So just to show you how uh, the uh, system which we follow, this is, this is the patients after no, in the morning, uh, these, these are charitable patients, so you can see this kind of assembly line, and each one will be doing, and the task will be shifted to the next area. So the eyes are marked, cleaned, and then they go to subtenons. So we have trained residents or 
uh, senior staff doing the sub tenants and after that you know the ot store nurse barcodes and then gives the lens uh, uh, to the patient and once the patient is uh, on the table they are usually guided by the running nurses inside the operating room there will be two running nurses for the single surgeon and two uh, assisting nurses like this so you can see there are two tables the surgeon would move on from one table to the other table by the time he finishes this case the next case will be prepped and ready for surgery so so by this we are able to kind of maximize you know the the surgeon's productivity in the operating room and also we we try to maintain a very high uh, safety and quality standards so just to show how uh, by just increasing the number of table and the nurses uh, the productivity of a surgeon goes up see normally when you have one table one nurse assisting and then the patient has to go in come out inside you know even the best of the surgeon would take 45 minutes to an hour so that is how most of the time it's not the surgeon is not skilled or the system is not efficient but the way how we do so so here you see uh, by the time you you finish a case then it will be so orchestrated so now exactly at what step that pay, next patient will be on table and then it will be prepared uh, the speculum will be applied uh, if it's a small incision they'll put a bridal suture for you and then keep it ready so that you go ahead on the other side and you you start the next case she, she don't regown and reglove between cases yeah so we we use an antiseptic solution on the glove and for every 10th patient we change the glove so that's a standard procedure we follow so this is uh, uh, just to show you the productivity of an eye surgeon at arvind there will be close to 2000 surgeries and the national average is less than uh, 400 so the, so coming back to your question now this is what uh, uh, we do a lot of uh, sharing of supplies uh, minimal use of single use instruments reuse of single use instruments with uh, very strict sterilization protocols they are fresh sterilized and they come back um, for use and a, lo a lot of time goes into supply chain management and uh, waste segregation and uh, our policy of reducing and also recycling and reusing certain things which can be reused so just to give you an understanding of what a life cycle assessment is when you take a, a, a chocolate like this no how do you get the chocolate no uh, it's, it's so complex you no know, from feeding a racing cow milking it pasteurizing transporting the milk and then sugar cane cocoa and finally you no know, all these come and then there is a manufacturing of chocolate which happens so this is the upstream and then the downstream now after we eat the chocolate you know the the paper which it is wrapped goes again uh, uh, for uh, disposal now again all this have to be see where it is going so any any thing like this whether it be our cassettes either be our tubings either be our knives or blades whatever we use has got this life cycle and we need to see how much of energy how much of water how much of transportation is going into all this to reach us and then how much of again energy we're going downstream to get rid of all this waste so that's uh, more about the inputs and the outputs uh, which we see so just to show you what happens in our system the surgery dress and gowns at the end of the session they go for uh, washing drying and then cssd the the trays and pans at the end of the session again they go for full cycle in between they are all flashed the surgical instruments are all flashed and the end of the day they go for the central sterilization which is full cycle surgical gloves disposed after 8 to 10 cases <coughs> and in between we use an antiseptic made by oral lab which is chlorhexidine gluconate so you apply that and then you do the surgeries and at the end of uh, 10 cases it goes to biomedical waste iv syringes end of every case to biomedical waste and same way any sharps needles and blades end of every case it goes for uh, a puncture proof container biomedical waste and cotton swab gauze whatever used for that particular case goes to again biomedical waste and the plastic drapes packing materials are disposed and then they go for recycle and they are also sold and we make a significant money by reselling many of these plastic drapes and packing materials and medicine and consumable containers again are disposed 
I think this video ran actually, but this is just to show you what happens in the morning. So how meticulously plastic and paper is separated at source, you know, which is very important. So all these are knives and blades you know, when they come with a cover. So that's, that's what she's doing. She's collecting all that and then separating the paper. The knives are already removed and it's on the table. So what they do is if I'm going to do 20 fakers, they will take 20 knives and keep it ready in the morning. So these are all the boxes where the knives, the uh, your cartridges and all that are stored. And then at the end of the day, they'll go into that container. So it makes the job very simple for them in segregation of waste at source, which is very, very important. So this is just to show you the, uh, uh, this is in kgs actually, the, the weight of uh, the disposables which we are collecting. These are the resaleable waste. So the paper waste, uh, the polythene, the containers which you use, big glass bottles, uh, lens covers, plastic paper, <coughs> cardboards which uh, come in packing material. So they all go for sale to the scrap vendor. So we're generating uh, uh, money from this waste because it is properly segregated at source. Initially when we are not segregating it properly, we are not able to do this. Or somebody was segregating in a different place which can again be a safety hazard. So now we made it a mandatory for the last many years. We are doing a segregation at source so that at the end of the day you have something like this and it can be very optimally sold to the scrap vendors. This is something which you are familiar of. This is a picture taken in Kellogg, but still I think it's the same here, right? At one FACO case at US and this is 100 plus FACO cases at Arwin. This is the end of the day. So this uh, uh, image was also, we, we, we published this work uh, some time back on the carbon footprint of an average single FACO at Arvind and in UK. So, so this is a UK study you know, which is showing you 120 plus carbon equivalents. And uh, in Arvind, uh, it's like running 25 kilometers. Do you want to run 500 kilometers or 25 kilometers? <laughs> <laughs> We need to revisit a lot of things for that. So lower the amount of waste produced, you know, we're trying to reduce and uh, um, this is what uh, we published in this work on cataract surgery and environmental sustainability. It was a very good work done by Casey Thale. She was a Fulbright fellow and I met her in one of the ARVO meetings at Fort Lauderdale and uh, she said she's working on hysterectomy surgeries. I said, you're an environmental engineer, what are you doing with hysterectomy? She said, my area is waste management. No, I, I see the amount of waste we generate. I said cataract surgery is the maximum done across the world. Why don't we work on that? And that's how this work started. And she came and spent six months with us in Pondicherry. And uh, this work was widely covered in US media also. Uh, in many of the US media saying you know, how much of uh, waste is generated for one FACO surgery. And we, I would say, you know, we, are, we carefully reuse a lot of things, like, uh, uh, like Prof was asking about the glove. We, we have several publications to uh, reinstate the statement that uh, nowhere it has affected or compromised the safety or um, the infection or related tasks or things related to cataract surgery. So this is one of the big series we published again from Pondicherry, looking at a year performance, you know, 42,000 surgeries. Uh, and, and uh, endophthalmitis rate was 0 0.07. And after starting to use the intracameral moxifloxacin in the last three years, it has come down to 0 0.02 now from 0 0.07, which is like one in 20,000. So there's a significant reduction in endophthalmitis even by reusing uh, many of these uh, things uh, and uh, disposing it at the end of the day. So, Recycle, as I said, no, we are sending it to the scrap for uh, recycling because of very effective segregation of waste. And this is very important. No? We were briefly touching yesterday also on this about repairing or the instrument maintenance. How when uh, many of you travel to Africa, you see a lot of beautiful equipments just lying in a corner. Beautiful microscopes, machines, FACO machines or uh, laser machines. Just because one IC is gone or the bulb is not available, so we have a very important department called Instrument Maintenance Department. There are very few biomedical engineers, but a lot of technicians trained
to repair ophthalmic equipments. Mm. So they are there in all the tertiary care hospitals. And uh, what they do is they do a lot of preventive maintenance. So every Sunday they go around oiling the slit lamps, making sure the joystick works perfectly, making sure the, uh, the, the uh, dust is cleaned on the mirror so that you don't have breakdown maintenance. So what happens is once you, there is a breakdown, your efficiency goes down. You know, you're wasting a lot of time on that. So there is a lot of carbon footprint in getting somebody from Topcon or Zeiss or Alcon to come and fix it. But if you can do preventive maintenance in regular intervals, I'm sure the people are ready to teach, but they will not teach unless we ask them because they are not interested. They are ready to change a part, but we'll have to make sure that it doesn't go. So some of our slit lamps, you know, the, the first slit lamp we are changing is after 15 years in Pondicherry, the Topcon SL1E. You no, know, we are we are not in fact condemning, so we are trying to remove some parts and use it in some other slit lamps. But this is the first time we have purchased four slit lamps after 15 years in Pondicherry to replace four worn out slit lamps. And all the Zeiss microscopes are still doing well. They, the ones we got to begin with are still doing well. Same way uh, the FACO machines, but FACO machines now because the technology is changing, they are replacing it. So they are removing it and then they are replacing it. But a lot of other things has got a pretty long life at Aravind because we do a very good instrument maintenance. And we train a lot of people in this instrument maintenance from across the globe. And uh, finally, uh, you know, this, uh, this is the fifth R I like, is to rethink. You know, uh, so uh, this is a box uh, where our... Uh, auto view lens comes. So this box is used in the coffee shop to take coffee cups. So if you want to take multiple coffee cups, so they use this, no, it's like a, a stand to hold that. So after that only it is disposed again to plastic and then it goes for resale. So you need to rethink you know, a lot of things. How many of you get what this is? Any idea what this is? They're light bulbs. Yes, yes. it's the light bulbs from uh, your Zeiss microscopes or water microscopes. So the light bulbs become beautiful flower vases. Okay, so housekeeping department hunt for all these things and they make sure before you dispose it, you throw it, they'll take a look and they'll say, okay, I can use this safely, then they use it, otherwise then it goes for disposal. The same way even some of the uh, four shops when they become blunt, they are used in the OPD to pick up the wiper or cotton and things like that. They're just not thrown away because you can't hold your conjunctiva. It doesn't mean that forceps is being condemned. So there's got another role for it to play. So you you reuse and rethink about it till the end of the life cycle. So we also promote like this, you know, to reduce uh, the resources. Lot of follow up in uh, vision centers. This is one thing which we did again very recently in Pondicherry. For the last five months, we have been doing it, and this is a three month data, you know, where. We never thought about doing this for, for, for a lot of time in the meaning because we were doing daycare and the patients were coming back to the base hospital. And one of uh, uh, the patient asked me, uh, doctor, can I, can I see in this vision center? I said, why? Because I live in the same building. I have rented the property for the vision center. I said, we've never thought about it, no? The nearest vision centers, even they have daycare procedures, the people were coming back to the base hospital for review. And uh, that started this uh, new system of finding out the nearest vision center. So when you enter a, a, a town or a village, it will say that this center is much closer than coming to a base hospital. So we have a program now, and the patient educators enter the, the place of uh, uh, where the residence is, and then it will say, if you go to this center, vision center, it's much easier than coming to the base hospital the next day morning. So now we are encouraging this, and interestingly now we see almost 19% going to the vision centers. This is a three month data where you see 19% of them going to vision centers. 13% going to our city center in Pondicherry and 68% uh, are still coming back to the base hospital because that is the nearest point for them. And uh, we have made posters uh, like this to encourage patients now for them to engage. You now the patient itself, I want them to ask. So can I see my review on first day at this vision center. So we have made some posters to engage the patients now. So this is what I, I told you in the beginning, see how we bring uh, uh, patients from our outreach. So this is how they come, you know, in buses. So around 58 people can come in the bus like this. 
and then they they go back like this no? <laughs> and then you go back and review them uh, and uh, this is one interesting point you know which is is there across all aravind except in madurai 50% of the staff live within the campus you no know, and we walk to the care uh, building i mean to the hospital you no know, we walk like this no not getting into traffic so there are two uh, advantages one is reducing the carbon footprint second is you make sure they are at time yeah, yeah? Right. Uh, for work as early as 7 o'clock in the or and 7:30 in the opd <laughs> so just i started this with uh, uh, some of the other aspects which we do towards environment and this we have been doing for quite some time especially the uh, the dewatch plant which we have uh, for waste water treatment Uh, the solar plant which we have installed in all the arvins uh, in the last 5 years now pondicherry got this 3 years back um, the garden and vegetation which fortunately for pondicherry i i'm not saying that it happens everywhere in arvind but fortunately because we have a beautiful land and this land was agricultural land no we are still doing agriculture there you no know, with the balanced land which is available behind the campus which you see and uh, when you come to energy efficiency i think uh, no i were even today morning i was saying uh, salt lake was much better if you go to many of the cities in us all the lights are on right even after they leave the office all the buildings are on all the shop lights are on you no know, you really don't understand why you no know, is it for safety or is it for showing how your office is beautiful in the night you no know? even sometimes you no know, i uh, in at ann arbor my wife was trying to uh, do shopping and then she went to a art gallery she was seeing a lot of things then we went for dinner we came back and the light was still on so she thought that shop is still open to get that small necklace or something since you walked inside and it says closed i said it's here all the lights are on don't worry we will we'll see how it switch it off later but but i think it's very important now how we brainstorm our team to be efficient in all this now how our team thinks uh, uh, so back at home only uh, key areas are air condition and uh, uh, recently in the last 4 or 5 years again we have changed all our lights to led and uh, very effective utilization of equipments like what you are seeing and uh, preventing a uh, lot of breakdown and uh, even educating our staff and patients about electricity and uh, uh, usage of electricity how they can uh, uh, minim minimize it uh, effective instrument and main electricity maintenance and also uh, installation of clean energy like solar so we are looking at energy efficiency so this is uh, 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 the plant you know which gives you a daily uh, calculation of how much of savings so since we did this uh, as of 30th june 2018 the financial savings is 6.2 lakhs this is 6 months for me in 2018 <coughs> so i am saving 6 lakh indian rupees on electricity by having the solar because almost 50 to 60% of the uh, uh, energy which is we conserve i mean we use is coming from our solar plant so so that is where you can make profits also and uh, regarding food we uh, uh, we have these beautiful gardens where we do everything but also we try to uh, educate our staff you know our nurses even our patients and like you can see this poster in uh, in our canteen saying you know uh, yesterday so many kgs of food was wasted and uh, uh, this can feed 50 people or 60 people just kind of you no know, kind of uh, brainstorming and the importance of food and wastage and water in addition to the uh, decentralized treatment plant um, we do a lot of rain water harvesting and we also try to reduce water consumption by using some efficient taps and things like that and also waterless <coughs> toilets but i think the most important part is high level of commitment from our leadership uh raising uh, staff awareness and engaging the staff in whatever activities we do either be recycle or rethinking you no know, they should they should understand what is this frugality in arvind it's not being stingy it's being friendly to the environment you no know, and being efficient in whatever we do and identifying and implementing new opportunities you know wherever we get and uh, also we want to take this message forward and that's the idea of uh, making this presentation and with iapb we had a beautiful workshop in september called i care delivery and environmental impact where a lot of uh, ngo hospitals from india and few other southeast asian countries were also there 
and we this was the message we gave them rethink green be the change solutions for sustainable i care and uh, we also want to take this forward so it's a systems issue right <laughs> so that's what uh, we see daily uh, in the operating rooms here electricity capital goods disposable single use materials uh, for ophthalmic surgery you know there are so many drapes covering the whole body and the every staff has to change their dress and come back so that is where we are going to travel 500 kilometers for every FACO case so if we can even reduce 50 kilometers in that or Jeff even if you reduce 50 kilometers I'm still uh, uh, it's possible with all your uh, uh, regulations and uh, uh, reimbursement processes thank you Yeah. So one thing that's always struck me about Aravind is how uh, socially, uh, I guess the so social responsibility has been such a primary driver. And, and I recognize how unique that is. And then also now to see environmental responsibility being a, a, a core mission, a core driving value. And, and it seems, I guess the question for me is, how do you create such a strong culture where that becomes the norm for everyone when it's not the norm? And, and how do you maintain that? That's a good question, but a very tricky and a difficult question. But the simple answer is, anybody at Arvind is trained at Arvind. So that's one thing which really you know, helps us to take this culture and value along. Either be you know, frugality or uh, there are seven pillars. I'll talk to you about that later for the Arvind culture to stay stronger and uh, continue the legacy. The thing is, when I come into Arvind, I didn't come from Shankar Netralia or LV Prasad or some from Medical College in Bombay. So I joined as a resident. Then I was groomed there. And now I'm at a certain position. Same way, MLOP comes from school, she does the training, and then she continues. Same way our fellows from different colleges, they have to do a fellowship at Arvind. And at the end of two years, you decide whether you are suitable for this organization, you want to continue right. or not. Or else you leave the organization after your training. I'm happy, you did a good residency, you completed your exams, okay. I'll give you a certificate and you can leave. There are somebody who I think will be groomed into this organization, then I open up an option for him to be a consultant and continue. So it happens on either side. Yeah. So that's the positive which we have. So everybody comes straight. See, that is where we are able to bring efficiency in any procedures we do also. Everybody will do the same way. If it is small incision, no, everybody will do with the Simco, with the Rexis, no, with the same uh, Indo-German or Kosla or whatever. But whereas if you see other systems, everyone will say, I want this instrument, I want this knife, I want this keratome. It doesn't happen there. Sir. Yeah. <clears throat> that, that question is part of the general problem of how you affect disruptive innovations as opposed to sustaining innovations. This is a disruptive innovation and uh, exactly. uh, it, it takes a break from ordinary activities. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for this comprehensive view. I have two questions. The first is just rhetorical. So the first question is, will you run uh, to be president of India? Uh, and the second question, uh, because it sounds to me like you could do an awfully good job for that country. Uh, the second question has to do with waste, uh, which I want to discuss with you after the meeting. Uh, <clears throat> because the waste is one of the ways you protect the planet. Uh, and I'm wondering if you think we can really protect the planet, or this is just a stopgap measure until we destroy the planet. <laughs> and uh, with regard to waste, uh, I'd like to uh, just mention that you have not talked about waste associated with <coughs> medical decision making. And the Institute of Medicine uh, estimates in the United States, and it appears to be true also in Canada, 
that somewhere between one third and perhaps a little more than one half of uh, medical care we deliver is either unnecessary or ineffective. So maybe we could talk about that uh, after. But th this was just, just a wonderful overview. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you, should, uh, uh, you should mention, uh, in terms of that, the, 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 the Google uh, capabilities now. Google has, I don't know if you have that slide up, but <coughs> they can they can take a photograph You know about this, Randy? I don't know if you know about this. You mentioned it to me earlier. So this is a beautiful picture, now which talked about what is statistics and what is artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's like your house now. Yeah, yeah exactly. If you put a nice frame over the switch box, yeah. Yeah, then it becomes artificial intelligence. Sorry, yeah. When you say only statistics, data, you know, it's, it, nobody comes to that. Once you say artificial intelligence, people throng around it. So while you're getting that, I just want to give a, <clears throat> a, a little different take on the future. Uh, I'm not a pessimist, I'm an optimist. Uh, and, and I think that what we're going to find is, is that a, a lot of the things we're concerned about now are, are going to transition surprisingly naturally. I mean, once the break point comes, <clears throat> and we have the battery storage, in which there's already technology out there that can do it, in which our, our cost per, per kilowatt hour storage, you know, per, per kilogram is, is dramatically less than what it is now. And, and there's already technology to cut that down uh, to a fifth of what it is today. And uh, it, it's just simply much less expensive. I, I think things can naturally transition, just like the Malthusian risk in regards to uh, the number of new people on the earth, which it proposed, has dropped dramatically, mainly because once people get a little better education and once things move along, the birth rate starts dropping dramatically. And there are large areas of the world where, frankly, their biggest concern is, is that they're not producing enough babies, and, and, and uh, particularly in the Western world, and, and their populations are gonna start dropping dramatically. The, the one exception so far, there's been Africa in that, which continues to, to not follow that general model. But India has dropped dramatically in birth rate. Um, Asia has dropped dramatically. So these, these things tend to come along. And, and one thing to think about is, is that just think of yourself as a health <coughs> officer in New York City in 1895. So what was your single overwhelming concern in 1895? Infection, public health. No, no. I'm talking about. I'm talking about trying to deal with 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 these kind of issues. It was horse manure. Horse manure was an overwhelming problem. The city was growing. Everybody had to have a set of horses, and the the amount of horse manure was filling in about ten city blocks, about fifty feet high. And it was a horrible <coughs> health issue. With you know, 1895, you knew about infectious diseases, the rats and the rest. They were talking about how this is impossible and the rest. And yet, you know, even though it's created its own problems, the rapid uptake of internal combustion engines has completely eliminated that problem in 20 minutes. So I, I just want to be out there. I, I think that you're going to be surprised at, at how fast a lot of things change. There's, there's already now ceramic tiles that also function as... Uh, that have a, a thin coat would be put on them, and already are solar collectors and solar panels. Uh, there's things on the outside I mean, that that could become made standard in, in, in a relatively short period of time. I think that the, the transition will be breathtakingly rapid, and we will see, and I think you will see the day, I might not live to see the day, because I'm an old fart, but you younger people, I think you'll see the day in which the idea that you're burning hydrocarbon to reduce energy will seem incredibly savage and, and old and old you can't imagine you know that that was something that was done so a, a lot needs to change and we could help it by what we do but I just want people to know that, that personally I, I think these transitions can, can happen relatively relatively rapidly the biggest thing that holds us back now and we can already do a lot in regards to the latest in solar is our storage capacity 
and uh, you can already get a lithium battery that it increases its, its overall uh, storage density, that's how much it can store per kilogram, fivefold, but then you get rapid temperature changes, and those rapid temperature can cause fires. But uh, uh, there's new technology that can, can overcome that. Uh, it, it's, it's already been proof tested in small areas. So I, 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 I think this is the kinds of things we need to do. I will also point out for us in the United States <coughs> and much of the Western world, it would, re it would require a profound regulatory change to get anywhere close to where you are. Yes. But I think you're showing that these things are possible without the mar marked increase in infection disease and others is, is what will be required. But it's not just ophthalmology. For us not to have to change a, 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 you know, a, a gown and gloves and, and all the rest between every case would be something you have to change, not just for us, but we have to change you know, throughout all, all U.S. medicine. And that's a huge part of our disposable. And the fact that you reuse it, uh, Alan and I can remember days we used to reuse our drapes and the rest, which would, would be a huge profound saving. <coughs> Uh, but, but sadly, because our labor costs are much more than yours are, uh, that makes it much more expensive. And so we need, to, we need to figure out ways how that we think about this in a, in a smarter way and, yeah. and, and to move things down. Yeah, so but uh, um, there are countries already, I mean, the, the, the energy utilization and waste utilization of a country like Japan, which is doing, in a, of a developed country, is doing way, way better. I mean, they're getting along with doing this at about a third of what we're doing in the United States, for instance. So those are the kinds of changes and best practices that I think could really make a, a very dramatic change. Yeah, my, my <coughs> that's a very nice uh, Go ahead and run that. description. I just don't want to leave it on an atmosphere that we're yeah. all doomed and we're all going I, I to. Think, I, think, I think these changes are going to be amazingly rapid. <laughs> you know, a lot depends upon uh, how wealthy you are. I remember uh, following World War II, uh, living in Europe. In Europe, every light switch turned off automatically in the hallway. Every light switch and every air conditioner turned off automatically in a rented room, yeah. unless you put the card in that indicated you were there. The in the United States, you just heard that all lights were all yeah, over the time. The audio cables? That, that changes, and that, and, and of course, that's, all, that's still the case in Europe. I spent a lot of my time in Sweden. Our new building in Mid Valley now closes down when the room's not occupied. Excellent. So the, the, the air conditioning and the airflow goes to 10%. The lights Excellent. turn off and turn back on. So slowly we're getting there. So I think a lot of people have to go. We're 10 after 8. So this is a two second. Oh, this, is not a, this is not another talk. Yeah. How, how are you paying for the new hospital? It's all from the revenue generated from uh, the existing hospitals. So you're paying with private funds? Yes, entirely. No, no donations, no grants for starting new facilities. So and their model's been self-sustaining. That's also good. Yeah. So from a single, from a single uh, now? photograph, now Google can predict the age of the patient, the sure. sex of the mm -hmm. patient, so well, allowing you to get it up. Whether they're into yeah. smoking or not yeah. smoking. The, the whole thing is going to happen with apps and other things like that. I give you a couple of examples today. How we provide healthcare. And I want to give you a couple of examples today. Healthcare is one of the most important fields AI is going to transform. Last year, we announced a work on diabetic retinopathy, which is a leading cause of blindness, and we use deep learning to help doctors diagnose it earlier. And we've been running field trials since then at Arvind and Sankara hospitals in India. And the field trials are going really well. We are bringing expert diagnosis to places where trained doctors are scarce. It turned out, using the same retinal scans, there were things which humans quite didn't know to look for, but our AI systems offered more insights. Your same eye scan turns out holds information with which we can predict the five-year risk of you having an adverse cardiovascular event, heart attack or strokes. So to me, the interesting thing is that you know, more than what doctors could find in these eye scans, the machine learning systems offer newer insights. This could be the basis for a new non-invasive way to detect uh, cardiovascular risk. 
and we are working, we just published the research, and we are going to be working to bring this to field trials with our partners. I want to get... Yeah. So it's like now you... Scratch on the surface. Of yeah. That. So you can know the age, the gender, the, whether he's a current smoker, HPA1C, BMI, systolic, diastolic blood pressure, all from a simple retinal image. Thank you. Thank you.